as you say, this, this is really trying to say that uh, I'm, I, I'm not sure where you're positioning it in your minds at the moment. A spanner is something that really hasn't got an awful lot of uses when you think about it. So this one's got two ends to it, but that means it fits two nuts. That's it. The, mold, the, the, the monkey wrench in the middle there, it has to be adjustable, but even so, have you tried using those things? They're not, they're not great, are they? It's called a creme anglaise in French. Creme anglaise? Yes. I can understand that. <laughs> yeah, creme anglaise is some sort of custard they don't like as well. <laughs> so, it's a, so it's a kind of same sort of thing. A mold grip, actually a mold grip's pretty good. I mean, when you have a mold grip, it actually does the job. It grabs hold of it. It does a good job. So the question is, well, what is online qualitative research? Now, I've got no axe to grind for online qual, because as you can see down the bottom there, Discovery is, uh, is in actual fact a, a qual and quant research agency. Um, Spectrum is a qualitative good facility, and the Thinking Shed is online qualitative. But you can see from that, I'm actually involved in a lot of aspects of qualitative research. So I've got no absolute axe to grind. So I, I, there's no reason for me to be saying qualita qualitative online is the place to go. Um, I'm very open, and this is one individual's views that I'm coming across with tonight. It's not necessarily the, uh, the views of the industry. I think I wanted to start by just talking about qualitative research principles, and of course this is grandmothers and sucking eggs, but I think it's important to set the scene for what I'm talking about. Qualitative research is small numbers of people and it's extensive detail. Our aim is to understand people's thoughts and behaviour and to answer the question, why? Now, there's been a lot of controversy about the question, why, in recent times, as to whether qualitative researchers should be even thinking about asking why. But bottom line is, that's what qualitative research is. It's answering question of why, if we can. And that's where we're trying to get to with the tools of qualitative research. So really what we're trying to do within this world of, uh, of uh, uh, Kahneman is to understand the conscious and the subconscious. It's the thinking fast and the thinking slow. That's really what we're trying to get to, system one and system two thinking. Albeit knowing we can't get to the bottom of system one. Uh, we can get fairly close, we think, we get, if we do it well, but we can't get to the bottom of system one. And we've got to get as close as possible. And the thing about groups and debts, which have always been our traditional way of getting to the information we require, is that they're great at tapping into the conscious. They're not so good at getting into the subconscious. And the reality is they probably can't get to the unconscious. But the subconscious is really the big, the big asking ground at the moment. We can use certain techniques within traditional qualitative research, body language, objectives, enabling techniques, and with those we can get to the subconscious. We can look at people's body language, we can look at how they're sitting, we can look at how their eyes are opening or closing, we can look at how people are thinking using some other <coughs> techniques, we can do all sorts of things that actually hopefully get us closer to the subconscious. But can we do everything? Well, to be quite honest, using groups and debts, there's a limit to understanding. It's, it's, a, it's, it's going quite a long way down the path, but there's a limit to our understanding. So it's perfect for answering some of the objectives, qualitative research we try to do, but it's lacking to some extent, if not to a great extent, for others. So we've got to find ways of getting into the subconscious if we can. Online qual isn't the answer. It's not the complete answer. Groups and debts weren't the answer. Online qual is not the answer. But it actually gives us different tricks. It allows us to do different things. It gives us different tools that actually put together with other types of research get us closer to the subconscious. Well, let's just consider how it all works and where it goes together or not. And to start off with, I'd just like to talk a little bit about what we consider to be the big question. Do online qual and group discussions, depth interviews, compete with each other or complement each other? And this was a debate that we had about 
three, four, five years ago. And Rosie Campbell of Campbell Keeman, some of you, probably all of you know Rosie. Rosie and I got together and we said, well, let's do something. Let's try and see if they complement or if they compete with each other. And what we did was we put our money together, we paid for this, it wasn't a, you can see it wasn't extensive, it was 16 respondents that uh, were done in two groups and there was 16 respondents done online. So we started with what we tried to get, which was a match sample of 16 on each side. Well, Rosie and I did this job whereby it was on health and fitness. And so Rosie did two groups and I watched them. They were one and a half hours each. It was discussion, plus enabling techniques, brand salt, cycle drawings, that sort of thing. I did the online, Rosie watched it, 16 people again, one week, seven tasks. We gave them diary, upload photos, upload videos, forum, stimulus. We did all sorts of things within that. So we weren't trying to replicate what we were doing, but what we did try to do is set the same objectives and see if we could get to the same answer or a different answer, perhaps, or a complementary answer, perhaps, by using the two techniques. Collecting information was interesting in itself because there's often this thing that comes up about, well, is online research cheaper, or is it more expensive, or is it the same, or whatever. Well, we just try to have a look at that to see, you know, is it actually costing less? Because the myth is online research is cheaper. Bottom line is it is a little bit, but uh, the myth is that. So what we did was we actually monitored how much time we spent collecting the information. For the groups, it came to about six hours plus and transcribing at the end of it. For the online, it came to nine hours without the transcribing. So actually, it was fairly similar overall in terms of the amount of effort we actually had to put in to get the information out. And when we came to the key finds, I could spend some time on this, I'm not going to, because there's a whole paper that we wrote on this particular subject, so I'm just going to come up with three or four charts and look at it. But the groups were quite intriguing, because the nature of the discussion and debate, actually the way it goes, encourages longer term thinking and generalities. So when you talk to a group of people about health and fitness, in a group situation, they tend to actually be coming up with things that are their, their long-term goals, their desires, how they want to keep fit for, for later in life, how they want their bodies to look good, how they want, and it's kind of looking to long-term goals. When we did the online equivalent, the immediacy of the tasks that we were setting, for example, with diary tasks, coupled with the here and now that you get with computers, actually resulted in much more short-term detail, detail being the operative word. You've got the real detail with the online and you've got the bigger picture from the groups. And online, you've got more awareness of intentions versus reality. So I'll go to the gym once a week, I'll go to the gym twice a week. These are the sort of things that come out of the groups. Online, they're saying, well, I didn't get to the gym yesterday. Monday's normally my gym day, but actually I didn't get there because so and so and so and so. So they're actually sort of saying, while I may be going twice a week, or thinking I'm going twice a week, I'll tell you now, these are the reasons I don't necessarily do twice a week. And they've got an excuse, you know, well, life gets in the way, doesn't it? You know what it's like, you know, we try to do this. But it was actually getting more detail, more short-term stuff. And, and diet and exercise were interwoven within the way they were talking online. But the intriguing thing, again, was there were two mentalities to come out of this thing. There's the reward mentality. And they were saying, well, because I've been down the gym, I can now go for that big night out on Friday. I can go binge drinking. I can eat dirty food. On the other hand, you've got the punishment mentality. It was saying, because I had a big night out, because I went binge drinking, because I had dirty food, that's why I'm doing the gym. And they were, get, they were falling into these two categories quite, uh, quite easily. You weren't getting that so much in a group discussion. It was a different way of thinking from the two approaches. Before I go any further from here, it's interesting to, to, to note that um, we also kept a tally on how much stuff we got back from the two methods. So we fully transcribed the groups, and actually not only fully transcribed them, we transcribed them by person. So each person was identified for everything they, they said or did. And we actually had some flip chart paper like this for each and every respondent, with everything the respondent had said. We pinned it up, 16 of them, that's the groups. 
and we did the same for the depths uh, for the online. We pinned up all the pieces of paper all the way down the wall with every single word that people had typed. Intriguingly, I did a word count, it was within 5% of each other. And I did stack it, to be fair. I did, I did screw it up a little bit because on day three of the online, I broke my leg. <laughs> so I didn't actually do any moderating. I didn't set up any new tasks on day three. Day four, I sent an apology out to everybody saying, I'm sorry you didn't set the tasks up yesterday. I broke my leg. You should see the stuff we got back after that. <laughs> you know? Don't forget it's health and fitness, you know, and things like that. <laughs> you're just coming in like there's no tomorrow. So day four, day five was really heavy with stuff. So that's probably why we got slightly more. I think we got more on the, online than we did in, in the group as well. And interesting, when you do this, when you actually go back respondent by respondent by respondent and look at each individual person, their contribution, it's not something I've done before. It's amazing that people afterwards you look at it and you think that person did nothing i've got nothing of any use from that person in the group and i've done it since and it's interesting in the group itself while you're doing it you're thinking you're getting useful stuff from everybody you're not it's actually when you see each person being transcribed they'll say things but there's nothing new in there it's just regurgitating or doing something else that someone else has said so i found that really intriguing so that's the, the experiment we did, and from that experiment, I think we came to the conclusion, yeah, they do complement each other. But we'll go on from there. Because what I'm talking about today is what we've called in, in, in our organisation the five wonders of online qual. Because what we try to do is to look to online qual and say, when does it work? When does it work best? What tools do you need to do to get it to work best? And how can we put it all together? So the five wonders of online qual, and these are them. Revealing the inner self, and I'll talk about each of these in turn. Customer journeys, brand investigation, communications evaluation, and unraveling behavior. They are the five categories, if you like, of where online qual can actually kick in. You may think there are others. There may well be others. I'm open to, for you to tell me, because I'd, like I'd like to increase this number. But I'll go through these because these are the ones we've identified. And I'm going to start with revealing the inner self. This is really the start point of what you're doing with online call normally. You're really trying to understand your customers, really trying to understand the people you've got in the community, trying to really sort of get to the bottom of what makes them the people they are. And who are they? Let's understand it. Because in a group discussion, I've got eight people I've never seen before. Okay, I'm spending some time trying to understand these people, but do I ever really understand them? Do I ever really know who they are? I don't know from online qual either, but I guarantee I can get closer with online qual, and I'll show you why. So the other thing is, this is perfect for bringing segmentation alive. If you're doing segmentation studies and you want to bring them alive, this is a good way to do it. So these are the tools that I would use for revealing the inner self profiles, so getting people to describe themselves, get them to keep diaries, photo uploads you ask them for, video uploads and forum. And I'll go through these. So first is profile. So for profile, we ask the questions that suit the objectives. We'll have a sort of certain number of questions we'll ask them to do, but generally we'll change the questions to suit what we're trying to get to. So the first thing I want from the uh, profile is a photo. I won't always get one. And you'll get an avatar sometimes, and you get nothing sometimes. But ideally, I want a photo. I want to know what they look like. And then I want to know things like age, marriage, sickness, status, children, what town they're in. You'll get that from the screening questionnaire anyway, but nevertheless, it's quite nice for them to sort of talk to you a little bit about it. It may be if you're doing a particular job, the frequency of using or buying something, where from. Quite like five words to describe yourself. It's amazing how you always get the same words. And we did this again. Interestingly, we did it again when we looked at the groups versus the online, we asked for five words to describe yourselves, almost identical, almost identical. You can, you can sort of look at the words and you can categorise them in certain ways, and there was hardly a hair's breadth between them. What do you like doing most in your social life, maybe? Um, who, who do you most like to be and why? You can change the questions however, but this is the sort of response you might get. You might get Tom, who's coming back with his answers here. 
um, happy, tired, friendly, caring, reliable, but he's got a child of three and six months, so it's highly surprising he's, uh, he's anything other than happy and tired. Uh, but he's like, he likes cycling, probably to get away from them. You don't know, but you can find out. <laughs> diaries. Revealing inner self diaries. I guess of all the techniques that we use, this is probably one I love most. Getting people to keep diaries. Now again, some respondents won't get into this. But an awful lot of them do. And it's diaries like they used to be. If you, get, you ask people to keep a diary about something in particular, it's amazing how they are getting into the role of what a diary used to be, the days of peeps or the days of, you know, dear diary, I've got, a, I've got a revelation here. I'm not going to tell anybody, just you, diary, okay? This is what it's all about. It's just between me and you. And interestingly, people are doing this online, probably because of the medium of the computer. They think it's, it's me and the computer. They know we're getting it, but they're actually thinking when they're doing it, it's me and the computer. This is, this is one that actually came from a diary we set. And I'm going to read it out because it's got some really good emotive words in it. I made a lasagna for Paul last night. To be honest, it took me hours. So you're already getting the feeling that you know, this is something that she's really putting her effort into. I'm not great in the kitchen, but I really wanted to make him something to show him how much I love him. You don't often get people instantaneously in a group discussion saying something like that. I bought the tomatoes from the market because they're really fresh. But even there, I had to go to three stalls before I saw the ones that looked good enough. The rest I got from Waitrose because my mum has always got, sorry, always said it's the best food, even if she usually goes to Tesco's. Again, you're getting some great, really rich stuff coming in. But it is all worthwhile. Paul loved it. Loved, capital letters. I make the evening really romantic with candles and music. I don't think he's ever been as happy. It was an evening I'll never forget. And I hope he doesn't too. That's the sort of diary entry you can get. You wouldn't get stuff like that so readily in the group discussion. Not even in a depth interview, unless you've spent quite a long time with this person and really gotten sort of warmed up and really loving you, then you might get it. But this kind of thing, I think, really epitomises why diaries work so well. Photos, we get them to upload photos. Take a few photos off, we may tell them where, outside the house, inside the house, your favourite room, whatever. We're trying to find out things about them. This one was a guy taking a photo, notice I said a guy taking a photo, of his study. It's his study. It looks like a child's nursery. And he's got, he's got teddy bears in there. I mean, talk about getting the child out of him. He probably goes into this place to actually come out of adult mode, to actually go into child. Really intriguing. So we have to look at what's around. It might not be what we're after. I mean, he's got his books over there. But uh, clearly, it's, uh, it's much beyond uh, just a... It gets into his psyche, we can understand it. I'm going back to group discussions now for a second. This is something we would ask in a group discussion in the warm up. Tell me something about yourself. Now tell me, you know, where do you live? Who do you live with? Um, uh, what's your partner do? Uh, and what do you like? You know, what do you like doing for yourself? You know, what's your, do you have any hobbies or interests? What do you like doing? Tell me a bit about yourself. And this lady came back with. I live in a three bedroom semi in Salford with husband and two kids. Husband is a welder, I like dancing and socialising. Okay. We are now creating our own picture in our heads about this person and about the family and about their likes. And we've now got a picture. It's based on our preconception stereotypes. So if you close your eyes for a second, Yes, please, close your eyes. Picture her, picture her house, the kids, her husband. Three bedroom semi in Salford, with husband and two kids. Husband's a welder, I like dancing and socializing. Okay, you can open them now. That's what you do with groups. <coughs> Here she is. This is what you do with online. That's a house. 
It's a husband. There are kids. Dancing. So far. I would never have pictured her house to be like that. I don't know what you've got in your mind. Yeah, but I've not got that. I didn't even cross my mind, I'm sorry, but it didn't cross my mind her husband would be black. I know that's probably wrong, but it didn't cross my mind. So clearly she's got me straight as kids. Dancing? Is that the dancing then? That's not the dancing I had in mind. And then she's socialising down the bottom, drinking beer. Again, that's nothing I pictured, but we do it in groups and we've got our picture of our person from the groups. Now, we've got a much better representation by doing it online. So, it's all very well starting from here, but what, how do we analyse this stuff? And this applies to all of the five wonders I'll be going through um, in a minute or two, so I'm only going to put this up once. So if we're doing profiles, diaries and narratives, how do we actually analyse it? Well, the answer is, we start off by analysing analyzing it like we would a depth interview. But we've got to look out for other things because the language is rich. Look out for self-confessions in the diary, self-flagellation, turn themselves off, personal me language. You won't get that necessarily elsewhere. And personal secrets, you won't necessarily get elsewhere. It's how responses relate to me. Photo uploads, video uploads, analyse what you've asked for, of course, but look out for wider cues. Furniture, the furnishings, the artefacts, have they got pictures of the family around? How fastidious are they? Um, are they keeping the place clean? Is it a tip? No. What, what is the importance of this to themselves? How proud are they? What signs are there of the family and the relationship they have with the kids? any interrelationships they've got. Is there a wealth there? Are there brands? Can you actually feel, feel the person? So we may have just asked for this stuff over here, what we've asked for, but this is really important and really rich. And beyond anything we'd normally get other than in a depth interview, of course, where you can see it with your own eyes. And in the forum, we analyse that. I haven't mentioned forum yet, but I will do a little bit later. We analyse that as if it's a group transcript what the interrelationships that are going on between people. And we relate it back to the individual. We consider the responses in relation to what they've said for me. We look at the me construct via diaries, narratives, photos, videos, any overclaims that are coming in, any knee-jerk responses because they're now in a social situation. So how are they switching from me to social? That again is something we can't necessarily get to so readily by doing traditional quads. So that's finding out about me. Now for the second wonder, which is customer journeys. How does it help here? There's a few tools to use there. Um, I'll go through them. What is a uh, customer journey within this context? Well, it's actually tracking the purchase decision making from the, from the outset or from a certain point in time. It's quite simple, but there are two real extremes here. On a lengthy journey, it may be from the birth of a child through to purchasing formula milk. So a time period going on there where you're trying to track, it may be from before birth because you may be actually tracking pregnant women and how they're feeling about it all. A shorter journey may be quite simple, it's actually going to a shop and selecting a snack. So we've got two types of customer journey there but nevertheless we need to, to monitor them. So we're looking for longer journeys because they're the ones where online really comes into its own. I would suggest, although I will talk a bit in the minutes about uh, taking photos and doing videos and stuff in short term as well. But for longer journeys, we're trying to find out how they're doing things, when they're doing things, what articles have they read, when did they read them, what adverts they seen, what, what influences have come from family and friends, were opinion forms uh, consulted, uh, what websites they visited, what shops they visited, and within all of this, how have they influenced the decision-making process that's been going on? And we can do it over time. <coughs> now, I know you can do stuff in traditional qual over time, but it's very expensive, and it isn't usually done. Whereas you can do it online over time, much, much cheaper. And you can get people to come in at the appropriate times and tell you, guess what's happened today? 
I spoke to so-and-so and so-and-so, and, -so, and they convinced me a Ford Fiesta is crap. I'm now thinking about a Fiat whatever. And you can get that at that particular time because they were, they were recorded in diaries. We ask them to upload relevant photos while they're out and about. This may be photos in the shops, at a little point of sale, it may be, well, it may be just looking at uh, adverts they've seen while they were around. It may be looking at um, uh, ad campaigns that uh, they've become familiar with. It may be just looking at the choice they were confronted with. But we can get them to take photos and upload them, and then we can go through that in detail. We can get them to just give us quick screen grabs of uh, websites, shows the website they've been going to, or what they like about them, what they dislike about them, give us the quotes that to, uh, to tell us of uh, how they feel about the things that they've been looking at. We can get them to look at literature reviews, so anything that actually has appeared, direct mail has appeared on the doorstep, you know, what about those? Because they may be influencing their decision, and in fact they've probably been looking at this if they're thinking about buying a whatever. So, the third, the third wonder is unravelling behaviour. Again, diary, video, forum, you can see there's different tools coming for different purposes throughout. Because reality is, we all do things differently. We're making tea, for example, a very easy example. Some people make tea using tea bags, some make it uh, using leaves, not so many these days, but they still do. Some people use teapots, some people just put it straight into the cups. Some people put milk in first, some people put milk in last. We've got videos of people making tea. There are loads of them. It's amazing how many different ways people make tea. It's staggering. But the client doesn't necessarily know that to be the case. And the client does need to know that's the case. So when you're showing clients clips and videos of people doing it, and they're looking at them thinking, really? Yeah, I'm afraid that's what they're doing. So it's really important that comms work under all circumstances, and videos help us to do that. And of course, diary comes in again if we want to track behaviour over time. Health and fitness regimes, credit card usage, media consumption, etc. So many different ways. Different use of the diary, because this is monitoring stuff, as opposed to monitoring emotions. But nevertheless, it's important. And of course, behaviour can cover so many different things. Shopping, social activities, sporting activities. We've got videos of people at gigs, you know, and sort of standing there and pointing out the problems with the food, the catering, the toilets, etc. You don't get that in groups so, so readily, but it's so rich if you can show the clients the actual videos that have been going on. Preparing food. Preparing food is incredible. I mean, the difference of people, the different ways people do it. By following recipes so strictly, through to just doing it the way their mums did it, or doing it whatever. It just varies so enormously. Get them to actually show you doing it. Get the videos. Get the kids to video it. You know, while the mum's doing it, get the kids to do it. Involve the kids. Get the kids to interview the, the parents while they're doing it. It's amazing if you get kids to interview parents, what you get from it. The richness of it is amazing. Especially if you say to the kids, don't let them get away with anything. If they say something that you know is not true, you tell them. You know, it's great the stuff you get back. Cleaning regimes, how people go about it. Personal hygiene, this is something I have not done. <laughs> but I know a person who has. I know, I know a friend of mine who's uh, been in research for not quite as many years as me, and many years ago actually said to respondents, I want you to video yourself showering. And they did. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe it either. But the only promise they said was that women will watch women and men will watch men. That was it. And they actually just went on and did it. It's incredible. Um, I thought I'd just show a video. This is actually somebody who was just checking out irons in, sh in the store. And it was videoed by a member of the family. So we just asked the member of the family to do it. It's got sound with it. But just to give you an idea, you know, there's no problem with doing this kind of thing in the store, provided you don't get uh, thrown out. But um, generally, it's not a problem. In this particular case, we were working for the company, so they're allowing it in. So let's go into brand investigation, the fourth of the, of the wonders. Again, these are the techniques we could use. And again, I'll show you how. Projectives. Well, we do use projectives using groups, but of course, these projectives are online. Why not? You can do it online. So this is Barclays Bank. 
That's the kind of responses we got for this particular job. We also asked them to do uh, pictures of it. They, they found some pictures of Barclays Bank. There's a great quote that came along with this. I'll just read this out because I love it. It would be a mansion. On the inside, everything would look spotless and tidy on the surface. But look under the carpets and the hidden corners and you'll find a lot of dirt and mess. <laughs> How good is that for Barclays? That's a few years ago. <laughs> Imagine Coca-Cola died, what you put on the tombstone. It has so many different projectors and enabling techniques you can do online, no problem. <coughs> this is quite intriguing, we just said, just Google any images you can think of. This is you having a headache before you've taken your Neurofen. Amazing quality of stuff coming in. And look at the, look at the, sort of the, the justification that comes with it as well. <coughs> Incredible, great, flowery language to come out of this stuff. And we could put uh, collages together from the stuff that people do to show the clients. This is financial emotions. I we could talk through each of those. And the last thing I want to talk about is communications evaluation. There's only a couple of things we would use here, the stimulus tool and the forum. And incidentally, I wish to point out that, that the stimulus tool is, is a tool that, that mo many, many uh, online um, platforms have got something like this now. Um, so I will be showing our particular one, but please bear in mind, you know, it's just like I say in Radio 1, you can buy from other supermarkets as well, or whatever they say. And they're trying to say, I'm sorry, we've actually mentioned a brand name. So this is the sort of thing that you can do. So with this, it's uh, packaging or billboard advertising, what we get is respondents to actually create boxes. There's a box being created here that's uh, neutral, and they put a comment up here to tell us what they're talking about there. And the boxes they drag and drop to make it the size they want to. They can do it in green, they can do it for positive, they can do it in red for negative, they can do it in yellow for neutral. So that's for the, the adverts. This one is just looking at a static web page, and again, we can look at elements of the web page, people's individual views about it. We can look at multi page booklets, brochures, collages, we can look at videos of things, adverts or whatever. It's just techniques you can use to, uh, to get individual assessments to these things. And they're quite useful, or very useful, because very often if you're doing things in groups, you're getting the, uh, the leader sometimes leading a little bit too much too quickly. You get individual assessments here. Um, at analysis stage, you can do things like heat mapping. So you can simply say, okay, let's look at everybody that's been doing this particular thing, it might be men. Um, you can see there's a lot of green going on here, there's red, here, so the green is the positive, the red is the negative. And if you really just want to find out about one thing, you drag a pin down, put it there and see what's, what people are saying about it. It's all little techniques you can use, but these techniques are useful and you won't get them in traditional qualitative research. So it works very well. And the forum. I know I mentioned the forum, and I know I haven't really talked about it very much throughout, because a lot of the stuff I've been talking about so far is one-to-one -one stuff that we get from people. But when we want to get views of other people and we want the socialisation, we want them to talk to each other, then we put them in the forum. Robin and I are going to disagree with this. Where's Robin? Robin over there. Robin and I have had a long discussion about this, so I'm, I'm now going to put the, my view and then Robin's view. My view of um, synchronistic group discussions, i.e. when you try to get people online together to talk to each other at that particular time and to moderate at that time, my view of those is you don't get the richness of the language to come back. You get a typing competition where people are trying to get their stuff down as quickly as possible before they're so slow that we've moved on the subject and their comment comes in and it's not relevant anymore. So you actually get text speak, you get everything very quickly. Robin's case is? Ken, you've never done one. And I was talking to Deborah earlier who's just done one globally. And you actually get people really engaged, they're really honest. It's much more in a competition. So try one, Ken, and I'll invite everybody here to try one for free anytime you want, and you can decide. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to be as fair as possible. <laughs> okay, the forum. Well, this is for meeting and discussing. They can, they can discuss anything they want, but you're in control as to when they're doing it. And of course, clients can watch, they can join in if they want, or if you want. Um, and respondents can choose related issues to discuss. So, the last thing I'm going to talk about is access. The thing about online is it reaches a wider audience and it's got quick turnaround. It can go to B2B, hard to reach audiences, 
And in particular, that's where I do see online groups is working, personally. You can go nationwide, of course, very easily. You're not really constricted to just saying, let's do London and Manchester. You can actually go and get the views of people no matter where they are. And it doesn't have to be uh, in conurbations, it can be rural, etc. And of course, it's worldwide. Worldwide has its own issues. Because when you're doing it worldwide, you need somebody to speak the language. And when you get someone to speak the language, you need to speak the language in the way that you would have wanted them to speak the language. So the worldwide bit does depend on having very good moderators that you can trust elsewhere, and you need to brief them very well. So, that's pretty much it. I come back to the question, what is it? Is it a spanner, a monkey wrench, or a grip? Well, the first thing is, it requires skill. It's not something you can just pick up and run with it. The skill is in terms of moderating and analysis. Having said that, good moderators who are doing traditional stuff should be able to do this stuff. And a lot of the platforms do allow sort of first self, self, what's the word I'm looking for? Self service, self, it's not what I'm looking for at all. Um, does allow you to do it yourself. <laughs> do it yourself, that's it. <laughs> so a lot of the places do. So don't dismiss it because it's something you can get into. It's true, it is cheaper than a traditional qual, but not by much in my experience. And the last thing is, it's not actually a spanner, monkey wrench or mole grip. It is one tool in the toolbox. And if you get your toolbox correct and you've got the other tools to, to complement it, it's actually an essential tool. And that's it. So, questions, brickbats, thoughts, I'm ready. Mm -hmm.